Welcome all the viewers, all the learners and prospective learners of mass communication, everyone who has joined this video out of curiosity. Uh, I welcome all of you to this session on development of radio. In this session, we will be covering various aspects of radio, like the international perspective of its development, the national perspective and how it acted as an important source of disseminating information and communication during the freedom struggle, as well as radio during colonial times. We will also be talking about the state involvement. So let us begin with this session. Talking about the growth and development of media, having spoken of history of journalism and mass communication, as well as development of technology, we would all understand that media rediscovers itself according to the demand and necessity of time. So while we put emphasis on how journalism and mass communication has developed over the past century, we also lay emphasis on how technology has become a vital thing in our lives today and how the two of them interconnect. So looking at it, we are going to discuss the growth and development of radio. So first of all, let us look at the international perspective of development of radio. Radio became prominent during the Second World War and it was used in military activities to communicate from one base to the other and it also carried orders and commands. Now, if you start listening to it from the international perspective, you will come across this as a very interesting, exhilarating story. I continue. The technological development of radio was regarded as a revolutionary discovery in the modern world because during that time, we only had the print media. So radio wasn't a part of our lives till then. And in 1887, there was this German scientist by the name of Reinrich Rudolf Hertz who demonstrated that electromagnetic waves can be transmitted through space. His name got attached to denote the unit of radio frequencies and that is why radio frequencies are measured in hertz. The Italian engineer Guglielmo Marconi received the first transatlantic wireless signal from England to Newfoundland and this was way back in 1901. In the US in 1910, inventor Lee D. Forrest conducted a live radio broadcast from the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. And this is regarded as a landmark wireless voice and music transmission. Now these random developments in various levels added to the growth of radio as a medium for the masses. In the West, the development of the radio as a medium of dissemination of information was taken quite seriously. And in fact, with the development of commercial broadcasting, public service broadcasting was also taken up by the state in a very sincere fashion. The history of public service broadcasting is generally traced to the British Broadcasting Corporation in England. And the thrust of public service broadcasting is still very relevant in the third world countries because whenever we talk about development, whenever we talk about development issues, as well as the target audience who are not quite literate and who also do not have the idea of using technology, radio is the best medium to reach them. In some countries, though, it has been relegated to more or less being a mouthpiece of the state rather than the public. With the United Nations Project of Information and Communication Technology for Development, which we usually call as ICT4D, radio has gained some immense popularity and importance in the modern globalized world. However, it is important that radio adapt to the new and challenging conditions, which it most probably is doing because it is able to make its presence felt. The mark is being felt when we look at podcasts, when it, we look at various kinds of radio broadcasts, which youngsters do love to listen. And of course, in different formats. So, let us look at the history of radio in terms of its national perspective or the Indian perspective. Radio came to India during the British rule in the guise of an amateur experiment. 
In 1920, the Bombay Presidency Radio Club was established and this was with the help and support of Jia Chand Motwane. Now, Motwane is also credited with the honor of being the first to record and broadcast radio programs in India. With that, a few months before the radio club in Bombay, the British Broadcasting Corporation, we popular know it as BBC, it was given a go-ahead to launch a public service programming across Britain by the British government way back in January 1927. The state involvement started later and when India got independence, the baton of radio was passed from one government to the other. And during the colonial times, we need to understand how radio has developed during those times. Radio in India was an amateurish experiment as we all know and the venture of Motwane lasted only for one day. Next year, in a joint venture between the newspaper Times of India and the Post and Telegraph office, another station was launched again in Bombay. The signals were received 100 miles away in Pune. The third station, with the power of 750 hertz and a 1.5 kilowatt transmitter, was started in Bombay after two years. Bombay had a fourth station when Walter Rogers company started one with the call sign of 2AX. It was more of an adventurist church venture. On the eastern region in Calcutta, the Marconi company of England conducted a number of test broadcasts in various locations. Eventually, the Calcutta Radio Club loaned a transmitter from Marconi company and started their own radio station in November 1923 and the call sign was 2BZ. Now, the West Bengal government too loaned a transmitter from Marconi company and it again uh, launched a station with a call sign of 5AF. The Madras Presidency Radio Club, under the call sign 2GR, started operating in 1924 with Viscount Goshen, the governor of Madras, as the patron. This station closed down in 1927 due to financial constraints and the transmitter was donated to the corporation of Madras. There were two other stations, one in Madras and another in Bangalore. The station in Madras was operated by the Crompton Electric Company, the British company, and both the stations were operating in 1926. Now, there was also a one watt station which was established by the postal office at his home in Hyderabad in 1933. Having spoken of all this, let us look at the state involvement of radio. The state involvement in broadcasting began when Government of India signed a contract with a private company named Indian Broadcasting Company, IBC Limited. It, this was in 1927, allowing them to begin experimental broadcasting in Bombay and Calcutta simultaneously. This was the same time that following the publication of the Crawford Report, which came in 1926, the 2nd of March to be precise, British Broadcasting Corporation was launched on 1st January 1927, which was supposed to be a non-commercial and crown-chartered station. In fact, by 1926, it had already been discussed in the government about formalizing the system and structures of broadcasting. It is said that the rules of the radio clubs were brought to a forced end as IBC Limited thought that the sale of radio license could earn them a handsome revenue. In fact, Fielden had written in his book, Broadcasting in India, how most successful of the India's radio clubs, the Madras Presidency Radio Club, was finally forced to close down in October 1927. However, setting up of the first operational transmitters in Bombay and Calcutta took one year and considerable cost was incurred. Even the company was also underfinanced with only £42,000. The company could not sell as many licenses as they had thought they would. Only 3,594 licenses were issued by the end of 1927. 
India's geographical reality also came in the way because transmission became a problem. It was vast and of course there was no electricity in all regions of the country during those times. Thus the company started to feel increasingly that the realities of Britain were not to be found in India. BBC which was operating on the same commercial monopoly agreement between 1922 and 1926 was expanding rapidly in Britain. But in India there were of course problems to be faced. However, IBC by 1930 had opened only two small transmitters and had issued less than 8,000 licenses. Moreover, programs were also mostly in English, so all strata of people were not able to understand what was being broadcasted. In fact, the Secretary of State, Lord Birkenhardt, had written to Lord Irwin in a personal letter that IBC should make program for English-speaking population, that is to say the Europeans and the educated Indians of the cities, totally ignoring the masses. Thus, in spite of the government support, IBC turned out to be a financial failure. Any mass media will be able to be successful and generate more revenue only when it is able to reach maximum of audiences. But here, it was a failure. Ultimately, in 1930, IBC went into liquidation and was forced to shut shop before the completion of fourth year of its running. So, if you look at the broadcasting activities in India before 1930, it will be obvious that a lot of uh, speculative businesses was taking place in the area. For example, shipping of radio sets and transmitters. These people, along with programmers and the public, put pressure on the government and the government yielded and took over the Bombay and Madras stations in April 1930. Government of India decided to purchase the assets of IBC and those were placed under the control of the Department of Industry and Labour. In 1930, it was also the time of civil disobedience movement in India and the government could see the potential of the newly resignated Indian State Broadcasting Services, ISBS for short, and it was being utilized in the consolidation of the Indian state as well as the political unity. The post-war Great Depression also had an effect on the financial condition of the government of India. The financial difficulty was one thing and of course there was a lack of real enthusiasm on the part of government and it continued with broadcasting and which finally led to the closure of IBC in October 1931. The rumour widespread that in Britain there was radio stations of Bombay and Calcutta which might be sold to American commercial interest. The Federation of British Industry was visibly worried and they lobbied in the Indian office against the sell-off. There were representations and agitations which compelled the government to go back to on the orders on November 23, 1931, and it doubled the cess on the radio sets. In 1932, the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, started an empire service, and it resulted in the doubling of sale of the receiving sets in less than two years. All these sets were imported at that time. The increase in collection of license fees and the import duties on the sets and the components of radio sets were also resulting in an increase of government's revenue. So it should be remembered that though the number of licenses were increasing, it still remained confined to the elite group of the society only. And these elite groups were the ones who were able to get the information which was not available for the masses. So also the programs were made for the Europeans and for the educated Indians, not the masses. The picture of financial viability of broadcasting culminated in the government's decision to start a radio station in Delhi. And Delhi station finally went on air on January 1, 1936. This development was very important as radio began to be used as an indispensable medium of propaganda and this was directed at two enemies of the empire. The nascent Congress-led independent movement and the alliance specifically Germany. 
So, it was well documented in the directive issued by the Empire Intelligence Service in 1940 how radio was linked to intelligence gathering. We need our intelligence organization on the spot. With the headquarters in Bombay, controlled and administered by a specially chosen Indian. This is what was being said. It is clear that the cooperation of All India Radio would be essential, but there is every reason to suppose that it would be cheerfully forthcoming and the organization would also be able to produce a skeleton service of information about Burma. The first director general of BBC, John Reith, who is acknowledged as the father of public service broadcasting, was expressing his interest in the Indian broadcasting scenario. He wrote to the Viceroy, then Viceroy was Willingdon, on the issue of state-level broadcasting in India. Willingdon was quite interested in the idea and in 1934, he wrote back to Reith saying that he should help Willingdon find someone to work on a five-year contract. Now, Reith had written in his autobiography, Into the Wind, how he himself had mulled the idea of taking up the assignment only to be negated by the higher authorities. The man selected from BBC was Lionel Fielding to shape up AIR on the lines of BBC. Fielding, therefore, was not quite happy with the use of broadcasting for intelligence activities. But Reith and Fielding's vision to build up broadcasting in India on the line of BBC remained a distant dream. It was made clear to Reith that AIR will not be modelled in the self-governing style of BBC. Rather, it will remain with the industries and the labour department, as it already was since 1930. Fielding was not happy with the name ISBS. He wanted a name which would have an all-India personality and an all-India identity. He coerced the Viceroy, Linthing Go, into adopting the name All India Radio in 1936. Fielding recruited devoted young people and with their help and his chief engineer, Goidler, he started shortwave transmission in 1938 and gave AIR a wider coverage. Lucknow station was started on April 2nd, 1938 and Madras station on June 16 in the same year. In 1939, the Trishur station went on air and in the same year, the external services were also started. Fielden went on medical leave in 1939 and returned briefly only to permanently leave Indian soil by 1940. This was also the time when other uh, hand people like Frank Leogard Brian, he was a civil servant in the Gurgaon district and few others advocated the usage of radio for uplifting the rural community. This resulted in the establishment of rural radio stations, which was similar in concept of the community radio stations that we have across cities now. And they were working in places like the rural outskirts of the northern cities of Lahore, Delhi and Peshawar in southern Madras, Midnapur district of Bengal and the princely state of Hyderabad. These stations were eventually incorporated into the All India Radio Network after 1937. Another very interesting development was taking place during this period and the Indian nationalist movement was at its peak and the nationalist groups starting exploring the issue of illegal counter broadcasting. From 1940 onwards, there have been evidences of amateur radio operators setting up pro-Congress stations like the Azad Hind Radio. This radio station started operating on 26th August and this was in 1942 after the arrest of Mahatma Gandhi when all the Indian Congress committee decided to demand the British to quit India. The station was broadcasting on 41.78 meters and as it was a secret radio, it had to be shifted multiple times to escape detection. Historian Gautam Chatterjee has said in his book, according to the old records, Vithal Rao Patwardhan bought a broadcasting equipment of the Congress radio called Azad Radio in Nasik. It was kept in Shankaracharya Mutt from where the Azad Radio went on air. 
but perhaps fearing police raid, the transmission equipment was immersed in the Godavari River. Quoting Chatterjee, at those dark hours of new blackout, the Congress radio went on air and worked as an inspiration for the masses. It spread the message of secularism, internationalism, brotherhood and freedom. Ram Manohar Lohia and Vithal Das Khakar were given the responsibility to organize broadcasting messages and programs during the movement. Khakar was the chief organizer of the Congress Radio Enterprises and was answerable to Lohia. According to Owen Willemson, despite sporadic British jamming, the crystal controlled signal of Congress Radio was audible on then unoccupied 40 meter band throughout the Indian subcontinent and as far away as Japanese occupied Burma. The station transmitted recordings of Mahatma's sermons and call for non-violence, uncensored news, pro-independence messages, instructions for Gandhian activists and political declaration by the movements, underground leadership. So, so much was happening only through the small medium of radio. The first Indian administrator of AIR was A.S. Bukhari, who was groomed by Fielden. He was the director general during the war years and during the independence movement at the partition too. A new broadcasting house was built on the Parliament Street in New Delhi. And on June 3, 1947, Lord Mountbatten, the then Viceroy, Jawaharlal Nehru and Muhammad Ali Jinnah gave their historical speeches through All India Radio. So, this was a short journey of radio and I hope you found it very mesmerizing. Thank you all for being with me. Thank you.